money I am not able to find. Bonnie, do you see our speakers? Yes, sir. I'm promoting them as panelists now. Michael and Corcoran and then Nebosha also. Hi, Michael. Thank Hello you. there. How are you? Very good and, and with anticipation. <laughs> yeah, I had a bit of a trouble getting in, but now I'm there. I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, the trouble was only that we were in another session with the General Assembly and we were all coming at once. So I see. OK, OK. No problem. Be filling up in one second. Uh, we were just uh, Orkwin, uh, Gary Jacobs. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, you're muted right now. Uh, but I. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to contribute, and I'm glad that it also worked out with getting locked in into the system right now. I'm sorry if we kept you in suspense. We were. Uh, you know that's fine. I know. I know that we need to be in a waiting room, but you always get a little nervous because it was already 5:15, and then I was feeling that it, maybe something was wrong. But now I'm very happy that uh, we're all together. Great. So that well, makes cool us. Hi, Ortwin. Nice to meet yeah. you. Nice to meet you. So just give a couple of minutes for people to migrate over from, we were in a, a general assembly of the World Academy and uh, it was in a different format, so it was a different room. Uh, so Gary, how many people are, are linking into this chat today? We had 70 in the other room, uh, yeah. but that was only fellows. The, the conference is available <laughs> to, um, to, we've had, uh, We've had about 130 participants in the conference, not all at the all all the time. But the morning set, the session we just ended was a closed session only for fellows. So now this is open to everybody who's attended for the last five days. Okay. Uh, and I don't know what that number was. We had 130 speakers. I don't know if the total number of participants would have been much larger over time. All right. Let me introduce uh, Nabosha Neskowitz, who's our uh, Secretary General. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. We just had a really... No, he's, uh, uh, Nabosha is, uh, he's, uh, he's muted. Yeah, he's still muted. Yeah, I'm trying to find out whether... Gary, uh, we agreed I would speak for, what, 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Uh, let's say, I hope we get questions, otherwise you can, we can elaborate. And uh, let's say 15 minutes to start, and then uh, Orkwin will hear for you for about 10 minutes, and yes. then we'll open it up for discussion. And you can elaborate uh, on this very, very exciting model. We already, I already talked about it in one of the sessions uh, as okay. a preview, uh, right. but it's perfect. Perfect timing to have it today. Okie doke. So, Nagosha, I will introduce Michael. Okay. And after uh, this talk, I will, I will, uh, hi, Gary. Hi, hi, Orpin. We'll be collaborating in this session. Pardon me? We'll be collaborating, as I have said, in this session, the four of us. We always collaborate. <laughs> okay, I'm coming in. <laughs> Hi, Nebosha. Hi. Hello. Your daughter has 48 participants. And it'll keep and coming because we have a the discussion round, yeah. Yeah, and we kept them for two hours in locked in a room. So I think <laughs> maybe a couple of minutes in between. Just yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. A it little was bit of relief tight. necessary. Yeah. It was too tight. We actually left a buffer of 30 minutes, but there were so many questions and people who wanted to participate. We just, uh, we haven't done this for a long time, so we couldn't turn them off. Uh, 
Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good if people have such an interest. Well, it was a great really, It shows really, that how exciting the program is, yeah. Really wonderful interest we have. As soon as we cross 50, I think we'll start. We're just almost yeah. there. There is no rush, Gary. We're already in weekend mode, so take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been going five days a week, and I'm based yeah. in India, which means it's been going. My, my and my team have been going up till one a.m. every day. Oh, uh, you are still in. You're in India right now, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, uh, and we'll go on till <laughs> uh, about eight p.m. CET. So just to know, yeah. we have about fifteen participants at the moment. Yeah, yeah. fifty. Fifty. So yeah. sorry, fifty five zero. Highly motivated participants. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we'll start and I'll just give a little brief introduction and that may, there we go, we just crossed 50. Uh, I have a great pleasure today, I was gonna say this evening, but it's still daytime for, for most of you, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker and our guest speaker, uh, Michael Mellor uh, and uh, Ortwin Wren. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit, a little short story about this background for this meeting. Uh, about two and a half years ago, the Academy drew up a proposal for what we called an integrated research uh, and implementation agency uh, in the model of a global institute. We called it for sustainable futures and presented it to Ban Ki-moon just a few months after he had retired from being secretary general. And he was very enthusiastic about it. Uh, and after that, our other proposals, uh, well, uh, Michael was still the director general uh, at the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, we started having discussions, Donato and I started having discussions with him about a proposal for renewing our collaboration with uh, UNOG, which had started in 2013. Uh, and uh, uh, we finally came up with a collaborative proposal, which our fellows already know about the global leadership in the 21st century. And a month after Michael signed our, uh, a letter uh, for going ahead with the conference, uh, he was retired from a long and very distinguished career in the United Nations. And uh, I didn't hear much uh, for a while. And then uh, when we came to the, the final meeting in December uh, uh, of the Global Leadership Program, I thought it, it's only very appropriate that we invite Michael back because he was the one who made the whole project possible. And we invited him for the session on which we were going to talk about this need for an integrated uh, type of research organization. And I listened with great interest to his presentation, but uh, I couldn't quite get all the details. So afterwards, I went back and listened to the session again. And I said, my God, this is fascinating. It sounds like what we were talking about uh, uh, to uh, Ban Ki-moon. Uh, I have to learn more about it. And when I called and talked to him, I was mesmerized to know that they are already doing what in the last one year or so, what we proposed to do uh, a, a, as a concept, but never got beyond the concept stage. So Michael has very generously agreed to spend some time with us today sharing their real experience in trying to create what I believe is really a, a radically new model uh, for research and implementation. Uh, and Michael, with that, I would turn it over to you, please. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Um, and I'm very pleased to be with you. And I'm even more pleased if uh, all our continuous conversations are going to strengthen uh, both your objectives and our, uh, our work. I'm going to talk to you about something called the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. In short, 
since we are in Geneva with all the rest of the UN family, we also have an acronym, which is JESDA. Now, I apologize for the slightly clunky title, but it kind of describes um, what we are about and what we are set out to do. The, the sort of genesis of this was, um, was many different things, but um, uh, the sort of substantive genesis was the, the realization and the sort of uh, the, 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 the need and the collective uh, objective to figure out a way of, um, of, of uh, making sure that we can address um, the existential challenges that we have ahead of us um, in a way that makes sense. And, uh, and, uh, and, and sort of garner um, the science and make sure that the scientists who are working on um, cutting edge science and the science of the future and the technologies of the future um, are in conversations with those potential end users of that technology and that science. And um, so the idea was to align the science of tomorrow with the needs and the challenges of tomorrow in a way that is operational and that would make sense and would have an impact and would be benefit humanity to the extent possible. Um, the Swiss government decided that this was a good idea and so they, um, they set up um, a foundation that has the name I just mentioned. It's very rare that the federal government sets up a foundation but they did also to give us some uh, autonomy and, um, and uh, asked us to uh, um, to get on with it. This was a little bit over a year ago. And our job is really to, um, to I've already described the first part of it, but the fact is that we are there to, um, to anticipate. Anticipation is really the, 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 the key word of, uh, of our, of our uh, organization. We're not looking at science that's happening right now, but we really are looking at five, 10, 25 years down the road and to see how we make sure that that science and those technologies are used in the best possible way. So we scan what's happening um, in the um, laboratories and the universities around the world. Um, we accelerate um, the, that knowledge and help accelerate the processes that will bring these, uh, um, <clears throat> these uh, technologies to market, so to speak. But at the same time, we also make sure that, um, as I said before, that the, that the scientists who are working on these uh, cutting edge science have the opportunity to sit down and have a chat uh, with the potential end users, which we call, the, for want of a better word, the Diplomacy Forum, um, which are not just diplomats, they are government officials, they are NGO, they are U United Nations organizations officials. They are really those who op are operationally involved in implementing the different projects um, uh, and efforts to make life better for those most in need out in the field. And once we have an agreement between uh, these two groups who by definition or not by definition, but by habit and by history haven't really spoken to each other very much and who really have different languages um, and help them get to a joint um, decision on which of these technologies are the most appropriate um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to bring forward and to work on, um, then we also help them process forward uh, in a process that we have that we have created that we call the uh, the operational the operations room, um, and finally, once we are close to solutions, we will also we'll also be investing um, in them, uh, in usually by the form of grants uh, or public private uh, investments, to make sure that we accelerate to the extent possible um, the the creation of these solutions that we have come up with. So. We um, um, have uh, about 65 scientists from around the world now working with us. Um, they were asked um, back in the summer um, of last year to uh, look at, uh, at, uh, at a, a number of things, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, let me just go step back a little bit and, and put it in a, in a more sort of existential context. Um, so, as I said, we're bringing together uh, all of these uh, different representatives, not just from the scientific community, but also from the diplomatic community and from impact from citizens, uh, etc. And I'll speak a little bit more about who is uh, sitting in the room. Um, and uh, so we, we anticipate the advances in front frontier science topics, and, um, and we do that, uh, the acceleration and the bringing to market. But in order to do that and to do it in the proper way and to make sure that we have the right, fra the right framework, we decided on three very fundamental questions about people, society, and the planet. 
that uh, are completely foundational, if you want, and crucial uh, for our world forward and crucial for the future um, of humankind. The humankind. The first question is, uh, who are we? What does it mean to be human in the area and the era of robots, of gene editing, and of uh, augmented reality? The second question is, how are we going to live together? Which deployment of technology can help reduce inequality and foster inclusive development and well being? And the third one is, how can we ensure the well being of humankind and the sustainable health of our planet? How can we supply the world population with the necessary food and energy while at the same time regenerating our planet? So that's the kind of the, the, the existential basis, if you want. Um, we're very much aligned with um, the SDGs. Our, we have, have taken as our own uh, the objective of leaving no one behind. And we're very clear on the need for um, and the imperative of making sure that uh, ethics and human rights are a red thread through all of the activities that we undertake. So in order to answer the questions and to move forward, we decided, uh, and our board decided, um, uh, to, uh, to, work, to start working on four um, initial um, areas. And we've created four, in, uh, four thematic fl platforms. Uh, one is the quantum revolution and advanced artificial intelligence. The second one is human augmentation. The third one is eco-regeneration and geoengineering. And the fourth one is science and diplomacy. Um, so in order to carry this out, as I said, we created uh, what we call a uh, academic forum, which is uh, uh, 65 world renowned scientists um, who uh, agreed to work with us. I think that not a single one said no, maybe one or two. Um, and we asked them to look and to create, give us some, what we call some uh, uh, anticipatory briefs um, on these four platform themes over 10, 5, 10, and 25 years to kind of give us a, a, a look in their crystal ball, if you want, and come up with some ideas of what science would look at in those time frames in those areas. Uh, fascinating stuff that came out of it, and we can speak a little bit more about the substance of some of these uh, these uh, these suggestions and what what was into into these uh, twelve briefs that we asked them to do. But while they were doing that, we then created a parallel forum, a diplomacy forum, um, uh, with uh, some quite very high level uh, representatives of the other side of the coin, if you want, um, the uh, heads of UN organizations, uh, former ministers, science advisors, advisors to governments. Um, social scientists, uh, ethicists, um, etc. And um, uh, also there, the enthusiasm for joining this was absolutely quite astounding, really. Uh, I think that uh, our, I, I have spoken to uh, on, on every single UN organization head, um, and we asked about 16 of them to join us. Um, not a single one said no. And, um, and not just UN organizations, by the way, several, uh, several others. And again, there, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit more in detail in questions and answers. We put, we put all these people together um, uh, on the 18th of December for the first meeting between these two fora. Um, and it was an absolutely fascinating conversation uh, where we, they, 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 it was the first time they met and we had to sort of help and assist in, uh, in, in a, getting them together um, getting them to meet, getting to start understanding each other and understanding their entry points and their language. And um, the conversation brought uh, a, a, a quite a, a lot of synergy and some agreements on some of the themes that uh, we needed to start moving on, but also very clearly agreed on both sides very strongly that there were some transversal issues and very fundamental issues that needed to be taken care of. <coughs> One was ethics very clearly the message was that this was absolutely necessary and we obviously knew that already. The second one that was the governance issue, how do you govern these things and make sure that it's governed properly. A lot of the technology that uh, is coming at us at Wall Street right now is not governed and is not sort of subject to adult supervision if I may say so. Um, a lot of it is created in the private sector and uh, we need to start looking at, uh, at uh, how we're going to manage uh, these things and I'll come back to some of that as well. And the third one is um, to make sure 
that uh, the equity and the, 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 that the fact that this is not going to be benefiting just the North, but this is going to be benefiting everybody um, around the, the world. Um, uh, they then uh, they came together with uh, with uh, with with a bunch of of of, uh, of, uh, um, of suggestions um, that was then presented to our board on um, at the end of January, and um, the board gave us the go ahead uh, to move in, uh, deeper into some of the issues that they have brought up, um, and um, this is where we are now. We are sort of at the threshold. Of oper operationalizing uh, this, we will move uh, into uh, specific task forces that will start looking at the different areas, uh, about seven of them, um, and um, together, both sides with the diplomacy moderators and the science, the scientists, and then um, uh, in uh, in October we will have a summit. We will first of all have a report that uh, details where we are, but the summit is also an opportunity for JESDA to tell the public and tell everybody who is interested and to, who has been part of this to where exactly we stand, where, what are the, um, the, 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 where are we in the process, and how far have we gotten, what are the subjects that we're working on, which are the subjects that we will work on um, down the road. Um, and this is also part of our, um, of our statutory need to inform our founders um, about where we are. We have to go back to both the government and the parliament of Switzerland to tell them where we are because they have to take a decision soon on whether uh, we continue. We, have, we were a three-year startup and that case comes to an end in 2022. And um, so that's the sort of bare bones of it, if you want. One of the, um, the, the, the equally important objectives of what we're trying to do is the fact that we took very clearly um, the fact that the scientific community is probably the community on the planet that has been able to collaborate best across geographic divides, across certainly political divides in a very fragmented world, and learn from that and bring that in as a, as a very clear um, uh, upside. Um, and together with the diplomacy moderators who are very also increasingly clear that uh, we have to figure out uh, a different way of working together if we're going to solve the problems that are ahead of us. We have to uh, work better together. We have to break down the silos. We have to be much more networked and much more collaborative and much more integrated. So we are going to, through this, if we're successful, and I see no reason why we shouldn't be, to come up with a proof of concept or a very simple proposition really that it is a lot better to work together than not. And to come up with uh, systems that will uh, facilitate that. The system that we have come up with is called the Situation Room, and this is really a kind of a funnel through which we push uh, the different actors and the different subjects at, at an asymmetric uh, speed, depending on what they are. We bring in other actors in there, uh, such as uh, sort of social scientists, or artists, philosophers, uh, youth, very important, uh, the, the, the opinion of the public, to make sure that we have as broad as an acceptance as possible, and also that we build back um, some of the trust that has been lost both in science and in decision makers and the politicians and in the process, the international process itself. So if we can be part of rebuilding or coming up with a, with a different kind of multilateralism, then we will have done um, a, a good turn, turn, turn as well. Um, the, um, the structure of the organization is uh, just to give you uh, a very quick sketch we are, uh, we are in three pillars. We have a chairman and a vice chairman. Um, and then um, under this, we have three pillars. One is the academic and the science um, uh, uh, forum. That is the one that goes out and scans and, uh, and interacts with the scientists, uh, et cetera. Um, that forum is co-chaired by the uh, current rector of the Technical University of Zurich and the, and the, uh, the, the current rector and, and, uh, of the Technical University of Lausanne. So we have a very strong academic input into the work, uh, uh, which gives us also an incredible network around the world. The University of Geneva is also involved and the, 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 the uh, Graduate Institute here in Geneva is also involved. So uh, that, that is one of our strengths. The academic forum is uh, chaired by me. And, um, uh, uh, and then we are in the process of creating an impact forum. As I said, this is going to be the one that will 
both do the fundraising, but also be the one that uh, um, uh, manages the money that we're going to be uh, getting, hopefully, um, to be able to invest in some of these solutions as they move forward uh, down the implementation line. Um, I think, let me stop there basically, because we have now, I've now been speaking a little bit more than 20 minutes. Uh, I'm happy to go into sort of more details on any of these issues. Um, uh, all I can tell you is that it's uh, in, in, incredibly promising. Um, everybody thinks this is a very cool idea. The scientists uh, are presented with a kind of a funnel through which they can push their research and at the other end comes a, 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 a solution that will have an impact on people's lives. They like that very much. Um, the, um, the international organizations and their partners, NGOs, etc., are very happy because it gives them access to cutting edge science much faster than they otherwise would. And uh, get a partner, uh, get become part of a, of, a, of a very strong network. The governments are very happy because at the end of the day, it's their, sign, their, their citizens that are going to be benefiting from this. We have kept governments a little bit away. I have been informing them, but we are not allowing them to, to, to finance us at this stage. That will come at a later stage because we really wanted to, uh, to have a, a free hand at creating and, and uh, a, a neutral space in which we can create this outfit and not be subject to undue pressure. The only government that has financed, has financed the startup phase was the Swiss government, which is uh, together with the government of Geneva and the city of Geneva, which are the funders. But we have kind of tripled uh, their contribution already uh, through uh, fundraising from private uh, sectors. And I would say that the money is happy. I think a lot of the, the, the foundations and the in, uh, individuals who are interested in, in helping us uh, think that this is a very worthwhile initiative uh, to, to invest in. So we are off to a relatively good start, um, I think. Um, everybody I speak to and have spoken to over the past year and a half thinks this is good. Doesn't matter if it's uh, you know somebody that I meet in the street or whether it's a prime minister. Um, there's a general it's sort of instinctual acceptance that this is um, a, a good project. So let me stop there and um, happy to answer any other questions. Shall we take a few questions before we go on? Because we have plenty of time. Do you have a question, Gary? I have two yes, questions. Yes, I have. If you please, please go on. I please have the first question. Please. I can hardly wait. Michael, <laughs> <laughs> um, you've talked about the uh, uniqueness of the approach to the science forum and the diplomacy forum, and then looking at the ethical and uh, uh, equity issues. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how far does the conception go from the identification and formulation, how uh, getting these people together, where does, how far does this, pro I know you're in the, you're just a startup yeah. uh, in this, you, you're really, really very recently doing, but in conception, how far, where does the boundary of Guess does work end? Where do you, you know, how far does it go from uh, this research and working out things? What's the final product or does it yeah. go you know, along the line? Well, I can give you some examples already because I haven't said yeah, that would be helpful. That we have already done, that we have, we, have, we have incubated a number of issues and we're working on a number of other issues uh, already for this year. But the, the, the short answer is that it ends at the exit point of our situation room. Once we have a solution, an agreed solution, and once we have helped uh, it take off uh, through funding or creation of partnerships, et cetera, identification of somebody who can take it over and then work on it, um, then that's where it goes. We're a very small outfit. We're less than 12 people. Um, and so we're not going to be actually the ones who implement the, the, the solutions. We're hopefully going to be able to identify those people who will who are better placed to do that. Some of the solutions uh, will be um, are not necessarily physical tools. Some of the solutions may be a new set of rules, and they may be a new institution. Um, let me just talk to you about two solutions that, we are, that are already up and running. Um, one is um, an, uh, an, an initiative called IDARE, which is a, a research collaborative on how to use artificial intelligence in the health sector. That is 
already up and running. We help them fundraise. They are they are based in the uh, the, um, the Graduate Institute here in Geneva, um, and um, they are already doing you know off to the races. The other one is also an, a very interesting one, which is um, uh, uh, it's in, in terms of uh, of, of digital and uh, uh, diplomacy. Uh, the University of Zurich <coughs> and the University of Geneva are collaborating in the creation of a new institute that we are helping them with, that is looking at how to use artificial intelligence <coughs> in, uh, in improving our capacity to make peace, to mediate, um, and to look at new structures, a new diplomacy structures, and new governance structures in, the, in those fields. Um, that is already up and working. They are already teaching students. They are already doing research. Uh, we will uh, provide, once we have collected some money, we will provide a chair, a JESDA chair to, to this. It will also be an educational outfit for scientists and for the diplomacy folks, because they need to understand each other's language. And uh, they need to understand, you know, the, what decision makers and what policy makers and what the people in the field need from the scientists in order to be able to do their jobs better. And the scientists themselves need to understand what the scientists are talking about. And when I sit and listen to all these scientists, I have half of the stuff I really don't understand. And the other half makes my hair stand on end because it's really so far out stuff that... Uh, that uh, so we, this, is, this is already up and running and that uh, we, will, we will grow. We are now working ourselves on, um, on the creation uh, of an annual anticipatory science and technology report. This will be kind of an index of what's happening around the world on future, uh, I mean, what's cooking in the labs, basically, um, uh, and have uh, a yearly report that will also then form the basis of our summit that we will do every year. Our first summit will be in October here in Geneva, if we are allowed to do it, uh, in, uh, you know, and physically. So that will, I think, is going to be a rather important uh, tool for all of us, not just for us, but for decision makers, for policy makers, for the scientists themselves. This is the first time really, uh, and, and it was very interesting to see them work on all these things and then come back together and suddenly realize the richness of what's going on out there uh, in, within the very specific, whether it's quantum or it's uh, human augmentation, etc. cetera. Um, so mapping what's going on and having a sort of a, a critical mass of knowledge of the science that is coming down the pike is uh, going to be very interesting and very important, I think. Uh, also in terms of, uh, of the governance uh, of, of it the, and of how we collectively make sure that these, uh, these uh, technologies are going to benefit humanity and not the other way around. I mean, there's clearly in many of them, there's huge uh, risks involved, um, if nothing else, when you, uh, what, what you can do with quantum, at, at least what the scientists are telling me that, and telling us what they can, we can do with quantum in 25 years from now. Uh, we better have a handle on how we govern that and how what kind of rules we put in place. The same with gene editing. We already seen what happened in China with this doctor who modified uh, the DNA makeup of, of the twins um, and got in, thrown in prison for it. But uh, you know, it's very clear that we need to very fast um, get um, uh, get our get our act together. And in fact, one of the solutions that we do, we're probably going to be working on that uh, that was approved is the creation of a kind of um, science arbitration court, a place where scientists and others can come and get a ruling on whether they, what they're working on or whether somebody else is working on is ethical, is acceptable, is something that humanity wants, uh, that the risks are worth taking or not. Um, I think there needs to be an international place that is accepted, like we have the sports arbitration court here in Switzerland that is a final arbiter and what is uh, what is okay and what is, isn't. So um, I think that is a very one of the very important elements and if we can manage to come up with that and, and, and push that and be the catalyst for that then we would have done a really great thing as well I think. Uh, there are plenty of these stuff there's plenty of these things um, uh, <laughs> that, are, that are cooking and bubbling um, and uh, hopefully uh, if, if we even manage to do some of the two or three of these things we'll be we'll have done a good thing. My closing comment, and then I'm handing it to Natosha, I think that the combination of the technology, the science and the diplomacy is so important. One of the issues we've been debating in the Global Leadership uh, 21st Century Project, we did it in Geneva, we did it uh, in, uh, in here this week, uh, is the issue of 
fake news and how to handle the, the media problem, which has tremendous political implications and legal implications and all. And it's clearly not a, just a question of technology. It's a question no. of law and diplomacy and politics as well. So I think your approach really shows the... Uh, I think the, that the social aspect of, uh, of, of these cutting edge sciences is very much in our minds. And we have several of the scientists who are very, very who work on it and are very keen on it. And we will have some specific discussions uh, at the at, uh, at scientific level on it. How do we make sure that, uh, that what we come up with um, is, is benefits societies and the, the, the different societies uh, and the different cultures. And, you know, we have to take into account the diversity of, uh, of the people we're looking at and, that, and certainly that to make sure we don't create Frankensteins. Okay, I have learned that in December last year, the initial 12, just the scientific anticipatory briefs were produced. Yes. Is it possible to obtain uh, this document. Yeah, uh, I can. Uh, it, they're on. If I'm not mistaken, they're on our website. And let me, uh, by the way, uh, draw attention to our website, which is jesda.global, mm -hmm. and they should be uploaded already now. If they're not, please let me know, and I will send them to you. Um, it, was, uh, it was not there a few days ago. That's okay. Well, they should be. But anyway, uh, it, it, otherwise we can certainly make it available, uh, it, in, in, and certainly in pre C form. The other thing is, uh, if you go, uh, the other thing I want to draw attention to is um, on the website, um, you can um, sign on to uh, our best reads. The best reads is uh, every Friday, we send out a whole series of articles from all over the world on the issues that we're working on. And most of them are uh, scientific articles. Um, and, um, and it's a very rich trove every, every Friday. I mean, there's at least uh, two dozen articles that uh, that we send out and uh, you're more than welcome to sign on to that uh, all of you by the way okay thank you very much the second question is the following i have found a statement on the jesda's website that the international scientific community has not been much engaged in international policy making which yeah. tends to focus more on the role of governments political and economic intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and business community. I have the same opinion. Therefore, I would like to inform, inform you that a project on, the, on basic sciences and sustainable development ought to be established soon in WAS. It would be devoted to the whole chain of research and development with mm -hmm. proper structuring and functioning on the global, regional, and national levels should ensure a coherent approach to the present and potential future problems and challenges of mankind. Therefore, we are thinking about establishing a collaboration with just I'm talking about us. What do you think about that collaboration? Would you I be think, ready for that? Yes. Look, I think that in today's world, any organization such as ours, any NGO that wants to have an impact um, will not have that impact on that unless it, it is a networked organization. We have to create partnerships and we have to work together. We have to walk the talk that we, uh, that we and uh, I would be more than happy uh, for us to establish a partnership. Uh, and I if you hadn't proposed it, I would have proposed it myself. Thank you very much. We have not yet made the concept, but I hope we'll do that soon. And then we'll, we'll come back to you soon with a concrete idea, not, not the whole front, we would like to show something within the wide scope you have already. But as you go about that, I mean, you know, we are, we're, we're both of us, our organizations are kind of entering into this um, right in the middle of a, of a new trend of, of science diplomacy that is happening. Uh, if you look at the, the European Union is working very hard on that and is, wants to give itself a capacity for science diplomacy. Um, uh, they need a little help because I find their approach a bit bureaucratic as with many things they do. But they have a lot of uh, quite a few papers that uh, sets out how they want to do it and how they want to go about it. I think there is several governments that want to do it. One of the interesting uh, feedbacks uh, when we discussed and when I have discussed with governments, uh, quite a few governments came uh, on, on their own to visit us to sit down and talk, was that all of them wanted to hear how they could create a JESDA back home. So one of the products that we're going to be working on is kind of a JESDA in a box that we can give them so they don't have reinvent some of the procedures that we invented on the structures. 
and then um, kind of franchise, if you want, um, uh, to uh, governments where basically at the end of the day, this is where whatever we do is going to be proven or not proven uh, to be useful because it's uh, it's in the lives of citizens around the world that uh, we will we will make sure we will show uh, our impact. So um, I you know there's there it's a very it's a very uh, in, 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 it's a very what's the word I'm looking for energetic field if you want lots of stuff happening and uh, one of the things that we need to do and there's something certainly that we can do together and with other partners is to connect the dots between these many different initiatives to make sure that we don't sit and reinvent wheels that have already been invented. So as you set out your framework and your, your, your vision, I'm more than happy to either have myself or others or my colleagues to interact with you and have conversations uh, to, to, so you can benefit from our experience until now um, and, and point to some of the areas where we think that it might be useful to, to put emphasis. Thank you very much. And now finally, a piece of information for you. The year 2022 has been proclaimed uh, the year of uh, basic sciences for sustainable development. It was done by UNESCO in November last year. Was in, in the meantime, was has proposed to organize a conference in Belgrade, Serbia, in September 2020, and the title is Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development. We are working on the program, and let me tell you, very frankly, we would like very much to have you among the participants of the conference. I know that you might be very busy, but please write that down. It's September 2020, Belgrade, 22. Serbia. No, 2020 is already passed. 2022, sorry. <laughs> September 2022. It will be a high profile conference. It will be a real global event. And I have to stress, we will talk about connections between basic sciences and sustainable development. But we would also like to talk about basic sciences themselves. We would like to have basic scientists of the height class to, to obtain some kind of a, a picture of today's advanced research in mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology, and also all the connections along the chain of research and development. Okay. And I'll, I'll I'll send you very soon the information. Yeah, I have two comments to that. One is, please remember um, that our the central and operational word in our organization is anticipation. We, we, we will not work on stuff that's happening already now or, or on sciences that are already on the table. We are really, really looking at 5, 10, 25 years. A lot of other people are looking at what's happening today and trying and applying that to. One of the, the big problems that I have uh, when I speak to people and particularly heads of organizations and other colleagues um, is the fact that quite naturally within the first minute the conversation turns to the needs they have today that's their job they have to solve the problems uh, of the people that they're supposed to help uh, whereas i want to talk to them about uh, their toolbox for the future uh, and actually interesting enough a lot of them have already done much more than i thought in terms of looking to what are going to be their, their technological needs uh, down the road if they really want to uh, remain relevant and, and be able to, to to deal with the problems that are coming you know there's some basically massive problems quite apart from uh, from climate uh, there's health there's migration there's corruption there's uh, education uh, you know there, there's, uh, all of the issues that are that are coming from the urbanization of the global population are going to come up there's really there, there's not there's there there is so many issues that need to be dealt with we can only do it if we do it together and we can only do it if we have uh, uh, an integrated approach to problem solving. I mean, you know, we know all that and this is what the sustainable development goals are about. So um, yes, absolutely, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's work on that. But so I'm just coming back to the, I'm if I can, I'm more than happy to, to, to join you, um, but uh, I will talk about the future. Uh, and if you need uh, connections or if you need um, certain scientists to speak about certain, it, we may be able to help you connect with the guys that work for us, the guys and women who work for us, and, and see if they can uh, be part of your conversations. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Gary, uh, I, I think there are there will be a number of questions from the audience. I'm sure of that. I, I'm seeing that <laughs> in the chat and Q&A uh, uh, parts here. But uh, my suggestion is that, that we move on and yes, give a chance to the second speaker. And then if we uh, have time after that, 
we may ask uh, the audience to put questions. But okay. uh, I guess you, you agree. Let us then uh, move on. And uh, our second speaker today is Professor Ortwin Ren. He is chair of the Making Sense of Science Working Committee within Science Advice for Policy of European Academies. This institution, SAPIA, is one of the two crucial elements of scientific advice of the European Commission. Thus, friend, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva uh, also for your kind introduction. I representing today SAPIA, as you had said, SAPIA is the scientific advice for policymaking by European academies. It is a part of the science advice mechanisms that are valid in the European Union. And there is a very clear distinction between the scientific input that comes from SAPIA, which is basically an analytical skill that we understand the scientific background of an issue, that we will get the best experts from all the European academies together, and then come up with a suggestion of how to analyze the issue. The solutions are then given by another uh, um, issue or by another um, body, uh, and, and that's the uh, chief scientific advisors to the European Union, and, um, and they then draft the real recommendations for policymaking. So there is a kind of a distinction between the analytic part. So what is the problem? What is the diagnostic of the situation? Or what do we know? We can also have lessons learned uh, from the past, but then what does it mean concretely for the EU in terms of policymaking? That's something that comes from the chief scientific advisors. So just to understand a little bit of the architecture here. Now, a very, uh, I'd say, unusual demand was given by us by the European Commission to look into uh, the issue of what are the present mechanisms, but also what are the functions and what are the benefits, but also the problems of science advice to policymaking. And, and I think uh, what uh, Michael was just talking about, uh, anticipation is certainly one major issue that we are we're dealing with to see how can we make sure that the best interdisciplinary science advice gets to the policy making bodies. And how can we make sure first that they understand the issue and all its complexity. Secondly, that they can distinguish between good science and bad science or between uh, truths and fake truths. And uh, thirdly, uh, that we can also show that there is diversity in terms of policy options. It's not that scientists can say, you know, if you want to have A, you have to do X, Y, Z. Uh, that's not that simple. Now, we know there are different options. Any option has negative side effects. So we always have pros and cons. So we need to make trade-offs. And all of that gets in a very complex structure in terms of advice. And that was a reason for us to having this report to saying, look, it's not like the linear model that we had in the past. The linear model was, uh, we asked some scientists what is true. The scientists said, if you do A, you will reach your goal. If you do B, you won't reach it. So do A, and then the politicians will say, yes, well, A may not be as popular, but we can do A, whatever um, uh, period, and then this um, will be close enough. So that was a kind of traditional science policy model. And we believe that has never been really true on one hand side, but secondly, it is definitely outdated for the modern world. And that's basically true because you face three major elements here. One is the world has become more complex or better said our knowledge about the world has more complex. The world has always been complex, but we have thinking about the world as being deterministic and easy and mechanical. It's not. And so when we know more about the world now, we know it's complex. There are a lot of probabilistic issues that we have to deal with. Uh, uh, cause and effects are not that easy uh, to determine. And uh, there are a whole set of interlinkages of causes, also of moderators, of amplifiers and attenuators. All of this, you know, is builds a complex model, and we're trying to regenerate these models uh, in terms of you know, getting a better hold of this complex reality, but we always know it's always a simplification, and we always may leave out some very important elements. 
The second major point is that we uh, get more and more into a stochastic representation of the world. So we cannot say if A, then B, but we can say if A, then there's a specific probability is B with another one C, another one D, but E is out of the question. So that's absurd. And, and that's, again, a very important challenge for communication, because in the old world, it was very clear to say, if you said, if A, then C, it was wrong. Um, now you say, no, it's not wrong. It could be, but it's very unlikely. Uh, but D is both definitely out. And, um, and that is kind of difficult to understand for even for policymakers, but even more so in the general public. And the third aspect is what we call ambiguity, that, uh, you know, the more we work interdisciplinarily, we find out that each kind of you know, complex structure has many sides to look at. And even if we are totally truthful to the facts, there are different types of interpretations of the same thing. And the famous example, the glasses have full or have empty, has different connotations. Now we see that connotations, or we call it in a modern uh, language, framing of the question and the framing of the solution makes a major difference in how policymakers actually deal with the recommendations. If you say, if I take that vaccine, only half of the people will die, or if you say, if you take that vaccine, a half of people will be saved, will make a major difference in their preference structure. So in that sense, the more complex things are, this was very just simple examples, uh, things began uh, this framing, the way that we put it into language becomes a very, very important element. So what does that mean in terms of policy, science, interaction, or the nexus between policy and uh, science? And we've seen that uh, we see different functions of science for policymakers, and we cannot put them all together. We need a little bit to distinguish them and then to say, you know, what kind of problem do we have and what kind of function is most important. The first function is enlightenment. And that is still important because if you have complex systems, you have to make people familiar with the complexity. They may not be familiar with all the details, but just saying, you know, if you do A, it will have impacts on B, C, D, F, G, H, and maybe even more. So just be careful that there is a whole chain of reaction and so that people understand the entire system. So for example, the energy system or the agricultural system. And with the SDGs, which just, you know, Michael pointed, it's that clear that there's a lot of complex structures where we really need to have a better understanding. The second major function is orientation. And orientation means that, uh, and I think that's really related to anticipation, to say, you know, what are the main trends of the world right now? So we're thinking now about digitalization as a main trend or a main transformation. We see uh, issues of globalization, but also anti-globalization. We see issues of sustainabilization, so getting more sustainable is a big process now, and they We'll see that these kind of trends interact. Uh, they also create conflicts. And so it's very important to orient policymakers about, you know, in which world they are at this point and where the world is emerging to and what are the new trends, either technologically, but also socially and culturally. And uh, that's orientation. And that's very important. It's not instrumental. It's really to give people a feeling, you know, where are we now? To give them a position. And I think that comes very close, uh, Michael, what you said at your first question, where are we, you know, <laughs> and, you know, where do we stand right now? Now, the third one, which is very important, is strategic or instrumental. And uh, that's still very important, but it's more than what we had before. When we talk about strategic policy advice, we want to know, we know the goal. For example, we want to have climate neutral energy provision in 2050. Well, that's something that at least in Europe, everybody wants to accomplish. So we want to say, what are the best scientifically proven strategies to reach that goal? And at the same time, we have to look at what are the negative side impacts of using option one over using option B or C, because there is not a solution that is dominant on all things that matters to us. So the so-called dominant solution decision theory is one that's only existing in theory if we talk about complex system. We always have trade-offs. We always will conflict with something else and that we have a win, 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 win solution is extremely rare. So it's very important for scientists to say, look guys, yes, 
If you want to get climate neutral in 2050, these are the various options that we have and we can combine them, but each of them has also negative impacts. And you have to decide. And that leads us to actually to the next major element there, which is co-creation. If you start to think about trade-offs, you have to include the policymakers, but also the major societal actors to actually bring in their preferences to say, look, guys, you know, yes, we we want to get this neutral, but we don't want to lose whatever 50% of our employment. That doesn't work. So we have to find out a solution that will have, you know, create more employment or will have very good training programs for our people that work in the car industry. All of that is not just a scientific issue. It's an issue where we need the unions, where we need maybe some of the NGOs, where we need the car manufacturers at the same table. And it's not like the old model where we had the scientists set the truth and then we get it to the interest groups and they try to finesse about it. You know, the truth is a part of you know, how people act. And so we need to know how do we how do you act? What do you do with it? We know we have to get to electric cars and we have to have new mobility concept. You car industry, what will you do? Uh, and we both co-create solutions. That is extremely important because otherwise, you know, we can have wonderful solutions, but if the car industry and the unions and everybody else says, no, we don't want to tolerate the side effects there. Well, then it's, it's just, you know, a nice thought, but it doesn't have any real impact. So if you want to have the impact, we also need this co-creational space in which science works together with stakeholders, with major actors to develop solutions uh, based on evidence and true science. That is extremely important because we have a lot of interest groups that base their claims on fantasy, uh, on wishful thinking. And specifically, if you look in the United States, the Razzle's visual thinking was the main selector for truth. That doesn't work. And I think we need to be very careful about this, that to say, okay, science is still the best guarantee that whatever you do will do what you expect it to do. We are still not perfect in this, but we are better than anybody else. And so to that extent, having science as, you know, given the evidence what we have about what can happen if you do A rather than B, co-creating solutions with actors based on what we know and what we don't know, of course, we also have to think about how to deal with uncertainties, that's clear. But nevertheless, uh, getting that kind of creative space working. That's, I think, our major recommendation. And uh, we have also proposed a lot of formats of how to do this uh, in a kind of transdisciplinary uh, science uh, model. But nevertheless, my main message is here, the old science policy nexus of having one creating the truth and the other one creating the action is not working anymore. We need a better model in which we co-create solutions in which we have the interdisciplinary research that creates the space for evidence and we have the various groups and the policymakers that want to do really resolve trade-offs in the, uh, the public interest uh, for the public interest. I think also that echoes you know what you said Michael about you know the third major element being in you know for the, the, the public good. And I think uh, this needs good formats and we're very much willing to engage ourselves in these formats. And uh, if any of you would have any questions on this, I'm very happy to answer this. And this completes a little bit my little report on this big mother's report. You can still get this report and the Sapea um, um, uh, platform, uh, email platform. Uh, I have it right here if you want, and yes, that's how it looks. And, uh, and then you can also read a little bit more details about what I've just said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I uh, guess you have a, a question or two. Do you? Well, I'd like to open it up because I think my only comment is it's strikingly parallel to what uh, Michael was talking about. Uh, the same idea, except this is the immediate what's going on today for the practical issues and Michael's group is looking out more, but the model is, uh, I mean, the implementation may be different, but the principle behind it uh, is very similar. So it's perfect. It's a perfect combination. 
for both of you to be speaking at the same uh, same session on it. Thank you very much, Professor Wren. Why don't yeah. we open it for other questions and hear from others? Uh, Michael, Michael, do you want to respond? You're muted, Mike. You have to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. I keep doing that. Where do I find the, the report, Odwin? Uh, I'd love to, to have a look at it. Yeah, well, the report is defined. The SAPEA has its own homepage. It's S-A-P-E-A. -E and uh, and there is a report. It's called MASOS, M-A-S-O-S. And uh, But if you have any problem, you can can write me and I can send you a copy. That's no problem. Okay, but uh, so if somebody would send me your email, then not... Uh, that would yeah, be I can put it in the chat. Okay. Okay, Orpin, I have a question for you. Uh, it is well known that since the beginning of the 1980s, science and technology represents one of the four pillars of the socio-economic development of China, beside agriculture, industry, and military, it is well known. The extraordinary results of that development are clearly visible today. We all see that and see some kind of acceleration of all that. Thus, is there any organized direct or indirect interaction of the science uh, advice mechanism of the European or, uh, Union and the corresponding mechanism in China, direct or indirect? Are you following what I do? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Very interesting question. And, uh, you know, we do have, of course, a PIA has uh, um, good contacts to the various academies of science in China. I mean, there's the Social Academy, there's also the Academy of Engineering and the National Science Academy. They're different in China, as you know. And uh, of course, we're trying to uh, also be in contact with our Chinese colleagues. I myself have uh, a professorship at uh, Beijing Normal University. So I do teach classes there and I have uh, graduate students. Um, however, I think what's very different from uh, the European part is that uh, the science policy interface is different in a country where you have one party. Um, and uh, and a party that basically directs what's what's going on that has sometimes advantages or so, I mean we have been uh, working uh, for example in, in some areas on environmental protection uh, where we had the chance to give some recommendations to one of the ministers and he said well okay we're going to do this tomorrow and I've never seen that in any European context that somebody you know even Merkel you know <laughs> or uh, anyone uh, of Leiden or whatever uh, would go on and say oh yeah that's great I'll go and do this tomorrow um so this is something and it has its you know advantage disadvantage we you know I mean it's it's you know democratic legitimization is something different um but so that's that actually happened to to us and I think that was really interesting um uh, the other thing, of course, is that, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, the, 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 the policy um, uh, science interface is, is always, you know, under the, the scrutiny of, uh, you know, of, of, let's say, political correctness, I would say it this way. And, uh, and that is certainly something that is, you know, sometimes difficult uh, for scientists in China, uh, uh, even for the Chinese scientists. Uh, but also for foreign scientists coming in. It's not always visible, but if you go deeper, uh, that does happen. And if something is not welcomed uh, politically, well, it won't be heard. <laughs> uh, uh, and that can be much more dramatic than it is in, in let's say, in, in, in European countries. But I think it's really good to have that connection. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, with our science colleagues in China, we have a lot of very good cooperation and uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we also witness some of the difficulties and uh, and of course, I mean, you know, there is clear difference in political culture. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes uh, in this session. Uh, and let us uh, give a chance to people from the audience. And I uh, guess they have, uh, they can come in. And I see a question from uh, our colleague, uh, Mariana Borgeson. Uh, can she ask uh, uh, the question? I'm asking the support team. Can Mariana put a question directly? Yes, we, we will do that, yes.
Mariana is a fellow WAS. Okay, if not, uh, let me put the question instead of her. I see the question and it is, it is uh, directed to Michael. Hello, can, can you hear me now? Okay, okay, please, please go on. Mariana, please go on. Yeah, hello. Um, I, I'm sorry you can't see me because I'm on my on my iPad um, and I blocked the view because I don't want to be seen by everybody. Um, but uh, the question with respect to uh, the AI, and I'm actually extremely thrilled to have learned about this project, is um, geared to uh, Mr. Muller regarding Gesta. And I think this is a wonderful, wonderful initiative. And my question refers to uh, and a few names of uh, the participating agents. So what organizations are you working with? Uh, have uh, just uh, signed up the Asilomar principles? Uh, who are the main players? Are you uh, working together with um, uh, the XPRIZE uh, people in, in California? I would really, really be interested in, in seeing, you know, in what direction do we go? And first of all, uh, how can we can, how I personally get involved with it? I've been in uh, an artificial intelligence uh, since the 1970s. Wow, okay. Shall I ask answer now, or do you want to take yes, a question? Yes, please do. Please go yeah. on. Yeah. Hi, Mariana. Uh, well, first of all, on XPRIZE, uh, one of our board members is the head of XPRIZE. So already there we have uh, the connection. We have a very strong board. And you'll be able to see the names of the board and the names of the scientists and the names of all the uh, the diplomacy actors um, on the website, as I said, jesa.global. Somebody just typed that they had looked at it and the report is up. Uh, again, if it's not, please uh, contact me either through us or directly. Now we are we are uh, we are a startup. We just started a year ago, and uh, we're now only now taking the first steps into the operationalization of it. So the, um, the we we haven't we are in the process of creating these partnerships, um, but until now we have uh, sort of uh, crafted what Jesda um, within uh, our own groups and with the scientists that we have. Uh, uh, we would have invited to uh, to join us and uh, and the different organizations. Um, so we are now to, to start with. For example, we have now uh, not formal, but we have uh, very strong partnerships with practically every uh, UN organization and the Secretary General's office in the UN. Um, we are now beginning to uh, reach out to to NGOs. But you have to understand that what we are uh, aspiring to is to be a very operational organization. There's a lot of talk shops around. Um, and there's a lot of organizations in Geneva um, uh, that are being set up and have been set up over the past couple of years that are working in the in, in the digital area and the cyber area, et cetera. But most of them are, are working on uh, on norms. So they're working on governance. So we're, we'd like to do is to, at the end of the day, at the end of the process, have some very practical operational results that will make a difference in people's lives. So that, uh, that will determine also what kind of... Uh, um, um, what kind of partners we we uh, we uh, link up to? Um, we haven't signed up to the Asilomar principles yet because, as I said, we are not there. But we're we're very quickly coming to uh, to where we're going. One of the problems we have, if you want, uh, which is also a problem in terms of convincing uh, major donors to support us, is that uh, we don't know if we're going to be alive at the in 2022. That will be determined by the end of this year. By the government, by the parliament, and by you know the conversations that we're going to have with the with the decision makers here, um, because uh, there is a limit to how much we can we can go out, reach out, and say, well, guys, uh, we'd like to uh, partner with you. If uh, at the end of the day, in, in less than a year, we're not going to be around to do the partnering, so we take it step by step. But um, uh, as I said early on, um, our intention is very much to create partnerships. Um, now, in terms of uh, your own. Uh, uh, involvement in one form or the other. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't know you, Mariana, but uh, please uh, send me um, a uh, a uh, a mail. Um, my uh, my email is very easy. It's uh, Michael at Okay. Thank you very much. I'm a Syrian entrepreneur turned investor. So um, and I've been you know investing in AI and uh, bringing the commercial internet to Germany and uh, to Europe, actually, and investing in the uh, energy vendor, the investment vendor. 
So uh, this could be the beginning of a wonderful uh, partnership between WAS and uh, and just that. So thank you so much. I'm thrilled. And as you know, uh, Elon Musk has just donated a hundred million for an X prize yes. for carbon sequestration. So maybe uh, you could participate in that. Well, I'd rather have him donate for Jezda. Uh, we'll see how we can fix that. Well, let's get a part of it for for you. <laughs> But Thank I just you. to let you know that, of course, at the end of the day, we are going to enter into private pro public partnerships in, 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 in operationalizing whatever solutions we come up with. So there will be plenty of scope also from that end uh, to, 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 uh, to come in uh, also as investors. Thank you very much. There is another question, and the question comes from uh, Thomas Reuter, our colleague, who is trustee of us. He is basically the guy who made the connection between us and Ortwin. Thus, the question uh, is uh, for you. Thomas, please unmute yourself and put uh, the question to Ortwin. Yes, Ortwin, I just wanted to ask how, how you think uh, the uh, World Academy could best bring itself into the European policy process. I know SAPIA is a network of European academies, but how narrow is that uh, definition? I mean, we have a lot of people in Europe as well. So could we be a part of it? And if so, how? And what could we contribute? Perhaps a, a global dimension or something like that. Well, well, thank you very much, Thomas, for this question. Unfortunately, I'm not the person who can ask it. But I, I mean, I'm uh, a, you know, a part of this uh, academy world because I'm, of course, a member of the German Academy Leopoldina and the Bayer. Uh, BBAW, which are both uh, members of the SAPIA, and uh, and I was asked by the SAPIA um, uh, president Glovich to uh, to chair the, the specific uh, working group. Um, so maybe I'm not the person really who can decide it, but you know personally I would welcome this very very much. I think one of the things is what I really uh, complain about is the apartmentalization of the scientific institutions worldwide. And, you know, we have got so many acronyms of uh, aggregations of, uh, you know, it's ECLU and EQ and whatever it is, it just, you know, it adds and adds and adds and I have to go through all of these uh, acronyms to see, wow, I mean, uh, this is another academy or this is another union, this is it. If he had more, let's say, what I call transnational scientific advice, I think it would be much better because all the national academies are sometimes entrenched into national policies. They also sometimes have hard times to, uh, you know, develop their independence, uh, you know, given the governmental situation. And if there is a support, uh, you know, in terms of the world support, I think I would really cherish this and, uh, and, and I would encourage you. And, and if I could possibly, I could of course make uh, your entree, you know, with the, uh, the chairs of the um, uh, European uh, academies, uh, there are two uh, in total, but one that is, I think more important is the one in London. And um, and, uh, and 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 to Sapir, of course, um, mm -hmm. because I, I truly believe that this interlinkage between the academies is a very important element. Thank you very much, Odwin. I'll, I might uh, take that offer up. And yeah, I'll be please do so. Do so. I was going to yeah. ask Nebosha, if I may ask quickly something uh, to Michael as well, and um, because what really fascinated fascinates me and has been you know for for a long time is you now how do you facilitate a dialogue amongst different sectors in the policy process uh, how do you get people around the table the right people around the table from these different sectors so that you can be uh, not just a, a talk shop but a a, a a an organization that really is action oriented and solution oriented in that sort of transsectoral process. Well, that's the whole purpose of what we're doing. I mentioned the situation room process, which we have created, which is precisely what you've just described uh, in a better way than I did. It's really the place where we put together people who have, A, have never met before. Uh, I didn't even know of each other's existence, doesn't have the same language. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand each other's uh, entry points. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, it's a pretty complex um, kind of set of negatives, if you want, that needs to be overcome. One of the things that really struck me in, in this past year is because I thought it would be quite difficult and, and, and we understood that uh, sometimes I, uh, 
I, I, when I'm asked what I do, I, and in order to simplify it, I said we're a, we're a mixture between a dating agency and a translation agency. Um, but the fact is that the alacrity and the enthusiasm of the scientists to sit down with the end users of what they may come up with, and vice versa, was much, much bigger than I thought it would be. Yes. So these silos have just disappeared. Um, and this has been really a very, uh, very, uh, very, very, very positive element of this, yeah. and that we are totally. building. They, yeah. and not only that, but also they're, they're, you know, usually scientists are just, have been in the past at least, just as siloed as the policymakers and, their, and the governments. But where we're now moving in the direction, certainly within what we're doing, where the conversations are between scientists as well, and different kinds of uh, fields and different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of areas in which are working, where they're more and more clear that if we're going to make it, they're going to have to sit down between them and come up with something that makes sense. Um, yes. So, uh, so you know, until now, it's worked actually much, much better than I thought it would, and we're certainly mm -hmm. going to continue on that. Um, just since I have the floor, uh, Altwin and Leopoldina, I just wanted to let you know, for example, that one of the, the scientists that we have with you, I think, is your president. It's uh, Gerald Haug, um, who is uh, who is one of the, 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 the scientific moderators that, uh, that is working with us. So, um, uh, it's, but um, Thomas, no, he's... Uh, he disappeared. Okay, no, you're there, Thomas. This is really at the center of uh, of our identity, if you want. This is it precisely what we are, we were made to do. Uh, I so, feel very strongly uh, that that half the problems we have in the world is because the the right people fail to meet. I agree with you, but that's yeah. you know, if, if there is one thing that is actually, let me also mention something I didn't mention before. There's a, there's, it's not by chance um, that we have placed physically this uh, initiative in Geneva. Um, some of you know, others don't, but the fact is that Geneva, uh, International Geneva, as we call it, is really the operational hub of the international system. You, there is no other place where you have a kind of ecosystem like we have here with mm -hmm. over 100 international organizations, about 700 NGOs, 1,600 multinationals, a huge set of academic institutions that are linked to some of the stronger ones around, the, uh, uh, um, around Switzerland. And that ecosystem is working because it's a technical place more than a political place and a more diplomatic place. It's not New York. And the, 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 all of the, most of the structures are technical structures. It's a lot easier to get an agreement between technicians than it is between diplomats um, mm. uh, and politicians. So we are, we are leveraging that. Uh, and because of the understanding that, uh, that is, is very rapidly coming to, uh, into the sort of bloodstream of these different organizations, that they have to de-silo themselves completely. They have to start collaborating. They have to start integrating their different efforts. This we're seeing very strongly here in, uh, in, in, in Geneva and it's happening quite fast. So that in itself is a driver also of this, uh, this of putting together people that have never talked to each other before. It's really very positive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, so we are close to the end of the session, but we have time for one more question. Azita, please. Unmute yourself, okay. Yes, hello, thank you for the opportunity and Michael, greetings to you and uh, congratulations for how far you've reached with this uh, great initiative. My question is actually addressing this to Michael and all those three fundamental transversal issues that you mentioned, the ethics, the um, equity distributional aspects and the human rights. How are you envisaging to get there? Uh, do you see that uh, within these two communities that you have uh, brought together, the diplomatic community broadly called so, um, and the uh, scientific community, where do you have them? A social scientists in the scientific community or uh, the normative standards that international organizations have come up and they have they bring value. How will you make that happen? If what what are the plans there? Please un unmute yourself, Michael. Sorry, I've been being on Zoom for over a year and I keep doing, sorry about that. Anyway, it comes back to what I answered before. In, in that situation room process where we get people to uh, to discuss and where we put people together, there will be those different kinds of people that you've talked about. And we have in our group, and those who, of, who have committed to help us out, we have ethicists. Uh, we have some very strong professors of ethics and particularly uh, ethics in, in new technologies that are going to be following and participating in the discussions. We have social scientists. We have uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
who herself is a scientist, um, uh, has committed her organization to uh, to being there with us and accompanying us and making sure that uh, whatever conversation we're having, uh, we will have will be anchored also in in the in the human rights uh, um, uh, imperatives. So we we're very attentive to that, um, and even more so because, as I said before, um, it's very clear that all of the participants, both the scientists and the the, the diplomacy actors, want this to be ethical. They want it to be based on human rights. They want it to, base, to be based on the, 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 the sustainable development goals. And um, they certainly want it to be governed properly. So the, the push is, is there. And the push is also coming, will come um, from, um, from, uh, from, from the public. We are, we are putting in place systems by which we are going to reach out to the public as well uh, to make sure that they have, um, can participate in the conversation in one form or the other. Um, we are very keen to make sure that we have youth representatives, and we have them um, in these conversations uh, from different parts of the world. Um, so all of this is being built now, but I mean the, the sort of the principles of the architecture, if you want, uh, is very much there and according in, in line with what you were asking. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have to close the session. I would like to thank uh, Michael and Morton very much for their very interesting. Uh, speeches. All of us hope that some kind of collaboration would be generated with the two organizations they represent in this way or the other way. We'll see about that. Um, also, I also would like to thank the discussant from the audience. Thus, we are closing the session and we should move to the next one. Michael, Orpin, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you to all of you for participating. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. For, for and if there are more up. questions, please just uh, send me an email. I know that uh, Orhan was waiting you know, patiently for having a question, but if you just send it to me per uh, email, I'm very happy to answer it. Uh, we have to move right now. I thank repeat the uh, Orhan's. Uh, uh, my email is uh, available as well. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.